I want to welcome everybody here today. Thank you for joining one of the American Rose Society webinars. I'm John Corcoran, your executive director, and we're glad you're attending this and the ones that we're going to be having in the future. You'll be seeing those come out uh, at the beginning of this year, so make sure you're checking out our Facebook page and our website, and of course, your email, because we're always sending out blasts to let you know about these webinars. To go over today's webinar, I'm going to have Ms. Kim Merritt go over the instructions on how today's webinar is going to go. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you, John. Welcome, everyone. Today we have a presentation by Mr. Um, Craig Dorschel, who is also our vice president for the ARS, titled Introducing the Fourth Edition of the Guidelines for Judge and Rose Arrangements, a seminar for arrangement judges and arrangers. Uh, once the president presentation is complete, we will go into a Q&A session. At that time, you will have the opportunity to ask Craig questions. If you are watching the seminar with someone else, please make sure you post both names in the chat pod so we can make sure we mark your attendance properly <clears throat> for those of you that are receiving credit for attending today. Okay, so at this time, we will have a word from our new National Chair of Arrangements, um, Ms. Norma Booty, and she will also introduce Craig. Ms. Booty? Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Norma Booty, as she said, the new arrangement uh, judge's chair. Um, some of you know me and some of you don't, so I'm just going to tell you a, a couple of brief things about myself. I live in uh, Minnesota. I grow approximately 300 ro variety of roses of all classes. I've been an ARS member since the 70s. I, um, <clears throat> I served on the ARS uh, board of directors from 2000 to 2012. And um, I've been on numerous other national conventions. This is my first attempt at this one, though. So um, the aim of this committee is to try and increase the number of ARS judges and arrangers. Um, we are here to help people, to assist them, to set up seminars, schools, whatever they need to do and then to encourage uh, both the districts and the local societies that don't have those arrangement sections in their shows to do so. And we are here to help them. Um, I wanna mention that every year we have the North Central District has a spring meeting. And at that spring meeting, we have a uh, rose arranging seminar. And um, we have a lot of fun. It, so on Saturday and Sunday morning, and the dates for that are March 18th through 20th. If any of you are interested in attending, uh, the, um, the information and the uh, registration form will be on the North Central District website. I, uh, so at this time, I'm going to introduce Craig. I think that's probably enough about myself. <clears throat> Craig Dorschel is the uh, president, uh, uh, vice president of the American Rose Society. Uh, he's a master rosarian and an accredited arrangement judge and accredited horticulture judge. Uh, Craig served as the national chair of arrangement judges 2018 to 2021 term, during which he spearheaded preparation of the fourth edition of the guidelines of judging rose arrangements. Craig is also a student of Ikebana and is a member of the Shugitsu Massachusetts branch and the Ikenobo, uh, <clears throat> Ikebana, uh, Ikebono, uh, Ikebana Society of uh, Boston chapter number 17 of the International, of Ikebana International. So at this time, I will turn this over to uh, Craig to uh, go through the, the changes on the in the fourth edition of the judging the guidelines for judging rose arrangements. Craig? Thank you, Norma. Um, now, as I go through this, undoubtedly many of you will have questions, and I would ask you to jot them down as we go along, and then we'll deal with them after I'm uh, through going, going through the material. I actually didn't know Norma was going to be on, and I did want to call the your attention to the fact that she is the, the current national chair of arrangement judges. And I took the liberty of listing her email address here. So if you need to contact Norma about any business related to the Arrangement Judging Committee, uh, there's her address, applerose44 at hotmail.com. 
Uh, I'm taking responsibility for the completion and publication of these guidelines, and I'd be happy to answer questions about them, at least in the short term, but any other business really should go to Norma at this point. So what's the deal on the publication of this? What remains to be done? The, uh, the text was approved by the Board of Directors on September 10th of, of 2021. Let me see if I can get the slideshow moving. There we go. Except it's not showing on your, on your screen. Oh, well. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, what we need to do is to touch up and insert the illustrations that hasn't been done yet. We need to check the status on permission to reprint the color wheel. We need to then number the pages and create an index. You see this is all sort of dog work and add title and section head pages. And uh, Beth and Emily at headquarters are gonna help out with this when they have the opportunity to do so. And I am really hoping and expecting that this will be out in plenty of time before Rose shows pick up again next year. I do have several acknowledgments to make. Uh, oh, hell. Excuse me. There we go. I just, the slideshow mode just isn't working. I'm sorry. Uh, this edition of the guidelines is dedicated to the memory of Lou Shoup and in honor of Gary Barlow. I would not be in arranging at all if it weren't for those two gentlemen. And I'm sure many other people would be saying the same thing. They, my first exposure to arranging at all was at one of their workshops in Syracuse about nine years ago now. And I also want to acknowledge the efforts of Nancy Reddington with regard to this. Uh, Nancy preceded me as National Chair of Arrangement Judges, and she saw the need for developing a, a new edition of the guidelines. It had been quite some time, longer than it had been between the, considerably longer than it had been between the previous editions. But the problem is that that didn't happen during Nancy's term because life happened, several unfortunate events for her. So she was able to do that. But once I was appointed, we kicked this off on Nancy's kitchen table, going through the current edition and marking things that we thought ought to be uh, reconsidered for a new edition and going from there. Nancy was my consultant through the whole process of this. I also want to acknowledge people who were on the Arrangement Judging Committee from 2018 to 2021 at one time or another. Here are all the names. If, as you can see, it's quite a number. I thank them for their efforts, especially in the last six months or so of the term when I was really hectoring them to get the job done when I was beginning to panic that we would, wouldn't make it in time for the, uh, the board meeting. But in fact, we did. And I'm very happy for their efforts and any comments and suggestions that they made along the way. So let's get into this. First of all, some generalities. Uh, in this edition, I used the word arrangement to designate the tangible thing that we make that we observe or look at and admire and what we judge. I used design then as the intangible concept behind an arrangement or the quality of an arrangement. And that's because we are styled as arrangement judges. The title of the book is Guidelines for Judging Rose Arrangements. So I realized that in the garden club world, they tend to talk about designs and designers here in the American Rose Society, we're talking about arrangers and arrangements. Uh, very welcomed by many of the women involved here is that the word chairman was replaced with the, the gender neutral term chair with a capital C everywhere it occurred. Chair with a capital C is a person in authority over a committee or an event. Chair with a lowercase c is something we sit on and that, that occurs in about one place in the uh, guidelines. Uh, the word oriental has been replaced by the phrase East Asian. I'll have much more to say about that later on. And I have at very least attempted to be consistent in the use of terms style and type. So for instance, modern is a style and abstract is a type of modern style. Also the, the hyphenated capitalized mini floor 
which used to be trademarked that the ARS owned at one time. The trademark was abandoned and we use a lowercase single word mini for us. So that change was made throughout the whole publication. Uh, the organization of the book has been changed. It's in three sections now. The first section, chapters one through nine, is called Arrangement Judging Essentials. And what that consists of are the basic information and things that judges should be looking for while they are judging. We've tried to make this as concise as possible if so they could be referenced easily during the show and they will be at the front of the book and there will be no need to be leafing through one chapter or another to, uh, to find what might be coming into question. Then the background material and historic material and discussions of the various styles and types is grouped under the heading of background, this chapters 10 through 14. And then the rest of the book is the administrative material. It deals with schedules, with talks about awards, responsibility of judges, training, schools, seminars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna take this one chapter at a time. I'm not gonna obviously explain everything that's in a chapter, just the items that have been changed that I need to draw your attention to. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with the guidelines, at all if you're not a judge or maybe a new arranger uh this might be a little confusing but there's there simply isn't time to go through everything but i will highlight the uh what what really has changed so beginning with the arrangement judging essentials the chapter one is now using the scorecard and i'm sure all the judges and arrangers will be pleased to know that the allocation of points in the scorecard has not changed at all but there are some tweaks in that. You know, first of all, the item on perfection of the roses, the 30 points is applicable only to the roses in the arrangements. Uh, currently, all the plant material could be considered under that, but here we're saying the roses only going forward. And if there's fault with uh, fill or lime material, that would, be, that would merit a deduction of, of a point or points, that would be taken under distinction. I think the, the odds of this making any difference in the bottom line of an arrangement are, are very slim, but uh, we, we want to put a little more emphasis on the roses. Uh, another instance is that the judges are asked when an arrangement scores 90 points or more, but does not receive first place, that they mark on the card that the arrangement is 90 plus and one of the judges should sign or initial the card. And there are two reasons for this. The first is fairly obvious, is that it's some consolation that when you have an overall excellent class and somebody has an excellent arrangement that, that still doesn't get first, at least they know that it was deemed you know, worthy of a first absence, some other arrangement. And the other has to do with uh, apprentices who need to have proof of, of 90 plus arrangements uh, in qualifying for their for their accreditation. So we'll say more about that later on. Now we have introduced some violations that incur a penalty of ineligibility for first place. And I'm not going to detail all these here, but I just call that to your attention that we'll be discussing that at a fairly substantial length as we go on. And the other major factor concerns how you deal with naming. Uh, the horticulture committee was mandated by the board to make changes to uh, the, the potential disqualifications for naming and we have adopted the same uh, situations here. The proper name for a rose is the American exhibition name now, which should be listed on the card. And the American exhibition name is the name under which a rose variety is commonly sold in the United States. Uh, an improper name is a name that's applicable to the rose variety, which is not the American exhibition name. It may have been some prior name that was used, but if the, the improper name is written on the tag, there is no penalty. As long as the name applies to the, the variety of the rose, there's no penalty. And in fact, there's gonna be a big job ahead for listing the proper American exhibition name for the myriad of rose varieties that exist and until such time as that's complete and available uh, it's another reason for saying that there would be no penalty for having 
any name that was properly applicable to the uh, variety. This name is, is a name that is not associated with the variety and that is penalized still. So some examples. Uh, a recent one is Canyon Road, which was known at one time as Scarlet Bonica. The next one is one of my favorites. Uh, Rose Sold as Dark Knight was originally garden director Barty Miller. Have fun writing that on a tag. Uh, a rose that I purchased some years ago was Diana Princess of Wales, was renamed by Jackson and Perkins Elegant Lady. Jackson and Perkins loves to rename roses that don't sell well under their original name, but in this case, I believe it was either Buckingham Palace or Earl Spencer that one of the name changed. Uh, next one's another one of my favorites, Liebes Zauber, uh, a good German name, but if you're not conversant in German, it's a real tongue twister, and it's now sold in the U.S. under its, the, the direct translation on the name, which is Laus Magic. So any of those eight names on the tag would not result in a penalty, but none of those roses is all white. So if you happen to write, for instance, John F. Kennedy on the tag, well, then you would be penalized. Okay, chapter two is judging roses and arrangements. Now, uh, the major change here is that we directly refer to horticulture judging elements and guidelines. Uh, you're instructed to say that you would always be looking for form, color, and substance in the roses and the arrangements. Uh, admittedly, when you have buds, say, in a traditional arrangement, there's not much you can say about the form, but I think you you see the point that there, that it, you, if you're looking only at the bloom, the major considerations will be form, color, and substance. If the arrangement shows stem and foliage, you could consider that when it's appropriate. And the other elements of horticulture judgment are what they call balance and proportion and size. And size certainly falls under the design uh, elements of, of uh, scale and proportion, design principles, I should say, of scale and proportion. And the uh, let's, so it will be considered there. Another thing we list in there is that the judge should consider the number and prominence of roses when assessing a penalty for a lack of quality in a rose. And it says, for instance, if you have a traditional mass arrangement, maybe it has 10 roses in it, and you have 30 points applicable to the roses. So, well, okay, you divide, you divide 30 by 10, you get three points per rose. But is each rose in that arrangement really worth three points? And maybe one used to complete the back side of the arrangement, but there's a flaw there, nobody's gonna really see it. So the, the, will that rose be worth three points? It's maybe only worth one point if it's even, even that. But on the other hand, you should have an excellent rose at the focal point in the arrangement, and that would be worth probably more than three points if there was a fault of that rose. Uh, finally, there's a statement that was always there that said the rose bloom must not be abstracted in any way. It never said what the result was for that, but now we were saying that if the rose bloom is abstracted, the arrangement cannot receive a first place. Okay, chapters three, four, and five are concerned with judging the principal styles of traditional, modern, and East Asian. Uh, not much to say here about details, but the way these are organized is that they first list generalities about the particular styles and then any specifics by uh, subtypes or other considerations, and they list the higher awards that are available for, for the various styles. And for the most part, this was material was all listed for, lifted from the previous edition, maybe a little more added to the East Asian, and I take the credit or the blame for that, and we'll have, have more to say about that in a bit. Uh, Chapter six, judging miniature arrangements. And this is one of the, the major shifts and one that had some discussion and was, was initially controversial, but essentially was uh, eventually was unanimously accepted is that the maximum allowable dimensions for a miniature arrangement are now 12 inches in height, width, and depth as opposed to 10. No, one of the complaints I heard was that uh, was that the show properties had 12-inch niches for a particular society, and 
and they couldn't do that. But as always, smaller dimensions can be specified in the schedules. So what we're really doing is getting more flexibility for, for organizations that want to allow a somewhat bigger miniature arrangement. And that's really a result of the fact that miniature roses have been creeping up in size. And then when you throw in the mini floors, which, which are larger still, if you're restricted to 10 inches or less in, in height, width, and depth, it, it can be a real challenge to try and, and make an arrangement with good scale and proportion. Uh, now, the ineligibility penalty also now applies to use of any kind of roses other than miniature or mini floors in, an, in a miniature arrangement. And before anybody asks a question, you, you might say, well, should that have applied to a ro uh, arrangement that was oversized? And I got to be honest that that never, never came under consideration for some reason. And maybe it shouldn't, maybe it shouldn't, but right now, uh, uh, an arrangement that's oversized will be penalized under conformance, but it would not necessarily be ineligible for for a, a first place. Chapter seven is uh, judging dried arrangements and craft exhibits. And as far as the judging is concerned, there's considerations, there's not much of a change there, but we do include a stipulation that dried arrangements and craft items must not have been exhibited in any previous show. Uh, it was brought up that, that this has been abused in some cases, given that a dried arrangement handled carefully can last an indefinite amount of time. And I was told that in one locality, uh, the same arrangement was shown and show after show after show and won every time and never, never gave anyone else a chance to, to get a win. So we're saying the dried arrangements can not have been exhibited in any previous show. And as you'll see, that actually applies to any arrangement. It can only be shown once. Uh, chapter eight is on judging the special classes. Uh, first thing to note about that is that the, the court of etiquette classes are now included in this chapter as opposed to a separate chapter. The court of etiquette is defined as an arrangement with accessories for dining or food service. So it puts maybe a bit more emphasis on the arrangement as opposed to the setting decorated by an arrangement, shall we say. Uh, there was a ban of flatware or other eating utensils. Uh, we've taken that out. We leave that to the discretion of the judges, the exhibitors, and on the, the committees. Uh, frankly, flatware was not banned in any other class. So you could have a modern arrangement with a sculpture made out of forks, which I understand happened once, and there will be no penalty for that. But on the other hand, put, putting, a, putting a, a spoon next to a teacup in, in, a, in a court of etiquette class in the past would have been uh, a problem, but um, now that's, that's flexible. The judges class, we say the photography judges are included along with arrangement and horticulture judges. We define what a novice is. A novice is a person who has not won a first place award at the level of the show in which they're participating or a show at any higher level. So maybe I should explain that. If, if a person has never won any blue ribbon for an arrangement anywhere, they're a novice at the local level, the district level, and the national level. If they enter an arrangement in a local show, it wins a blue ribbon. They're no longer a novice at local shows, but they could still be a novice at district or national. But however, say they get lucky, the first blue ribbon they earn is in a district show, then they could be a novice at a national show, but they cannot be a novice at either a district show or a local show at that point. And if it's really strange and the first blue ribbon is in a national, then your days as a novice are over. Uh, we define what a junior arranger is, and that's that's a person that is less than 18 years old. That uh, goes along with the, the junior membership class in the American Rose Society that once you're 18, you can be a regular member of the ARS, and at that point, you would not be a junior arranger. And the chapter, as you will see, has a reference table of the requirements included for the various special classes, and we'll see some more about some of these. Now we talked about ineligibility 
for first place requirements. And that really came out of discussion of these special classes because these are in effect challenge classes. In the challenge class in horticulture, if you don't do exactly what the schedule says you should do, you're not gonna win the class. And we thought it was unfair to arrangers who obey the rules that if somebody slips up and violates one of the special considerations of these classes, that it's conceivable that they could still win first because uh, depending on just how many stipulations are in the schedule, the, the deduction for conformance could only be a point, a couple of points and that they may still be able to win. So in the Prince's class, use of any non-rose material would, would be an uh, ineligibility along with use of accessories, which are forbidden. In the Duchess class, which is supposed to be fresh roses and dried or treated plant material, in used dried roses or fresh plant material would make you ineligible for first place or along with use of accessories. The Duke class is about size. In the Duke class, you would be ineligible first place if you were if the arrangement were clearly under 10 inches or over 20 inches in height, width, or depth. And why does that say clearly? It's because I don't want to see any judge holding up a measuring tape and squinting maybe at the wrong angle and trying to decide if a, if an arrangement is over or under by an eighth of an inch or something like that. Uh, it just gets into uncertainty and quibbling, but it, if you look at it and it's clearly unequivocally over or under size, then, then that would be ineligible. And then the if in the miniature versions of the Princess and Duchess, if you used uh, the wrong roses, something other than a miniature or mini flora, you would be ineligible. So how do you handle these arrangements that have violations in it? That, that's a good question. First of all, if you look at the class and if the arrangement with the violation in it is clearly not going to be the best no matter what, your job is more or less done other than deciding whether it's going to be second or third or whatever once you've taken off the points of conformance. Otherwise, if you look at it and say, boy, that's a really good arrangement and I wish they hadn't made that mistake. Uh, I would suggest you maybe point score the class or maybe point score the best two arrangements in the class. Take the usual deductions under conformance as they are appropriate. And after you do that, the arrangement with the violation still has the highest score. Well, sorry, but it's then relegated most likely to second. Then you, then you would consider the, the second bet, what well, had been the second best arrangement. And if it's 90 or better, you could give it first. If it's 90, or two or better and otherwise uh, eligible for a higher award, you can give it the higher award, such as the, uh, such as a Princess Rosetta or a uh, certificate. Personal endowments, not much to say there. We did make a note that bridal fashions and bouquet styles have changed. So what may have been appropriate for a bridal bouquet if that, or a bridesmaid's bouquet if that had been if that's specified in the schedule. What somebody may have seen 20 or 30 years ago may not reflect what the, the current fashions are and, and judges will simply be aware of that. Okay, and then we can move on to the background section. Uh, chapter 10 is arranging with roses. Not many changes to that really. That's all basics and materials. Uh, one thing that puzzled me was uh, the definitions of accessories and features that were in there. And I do thank Pat Bilson for coming up with good definitions for the glossary. And I went back and, and added those to this chapter after the fact. But an accessory is something which enhances the design of an arrangement, but it's not integral to it. So that if you remove an accessory, the design of the arrangement is still intact. You still have, a, you still have an arrangement that stands on its own. A feature is something which is more dominant, and if you remove the feature, it makes the design of the arrangement incomplete and unsatisfactory. And basically what we are saying is that really the roses should be featured in, a, in an arrangement in a rose show. If there's something else that you would take out and you would no longer have an arrangement, you maybe just have a couple of roses in the base, that, that's a problem. So uh, basically, 
that just enhances the fact that the roses are supposed to be the dominant floral material in, in an arrangement. Uh, chapter 11, the elements and principles of design. Again, that's basic material that doesn't change. Uh, for my own satisfaction and confusion about how colors are described, I, I put in some footnotes and some parentheses. Uh, it turns out the primary colors talked about in say painting or for that matter floral arranging are different from the discussion of primary colors for photography and computer screens and, and television, which is what I'm more used to. So I added a footnote that said that uh, there are different primary color schemes and uh, the red, green, blue, which is your TVs, computer screens, color projectors, and the CYMK, which is your color printing, essentially cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. Uh, just Again, that was almost more for my benefit than anything else, but I think with people working these other other media, it maybe clarifies things a bit. Uh, chapters 12 and 13 are the history and background on traditional and modern arrangements. Uh, for traditional, again, not much different, you know, maybe a little change of wording here and there, but for the most part, this was lifted from the previous edition. On the modern arrangements, well, there wasn't much history to cite, actually. Uh, and in fact, this was, I think, the very last chapter we worked on under the gun to, to get finished. Uh, but we did cite the relationship of the modern Western arranging styles uh, to artistic and architectural movements in the early 20th century. And I pulled out of the air Cubism, Bauhaus, and Art Deco as examples of that, that, that could be influences on, uh, on floor arranging and, and so forth. Uh, now the, the chapter listed in the past, listed a great number of types of modern arrangements. We took some of those out. The ones that we took out were ones that I would be seldom if ever seen in rose shows, mostly because it would be difficult to actually make the roses a dominant element in, in those particular types. That's not to say that uh, there's any limitation to making a modern arrangement that that's only a type listed in the manual. Anything else would do uh, as long as the roses were the dominant floral material. But we just didn't want to clutter up the chapter with, uh, with unnecessary material. Uh, chapter 14 is East Asian arrangements, history and background. And I'll spend a little more time on this. If you remember, this is what we used to call arrangements in the Oriental manner. Now, before anything else, that, that phrase always struck me as kind of awkward and quaint. Uh, but I, I noted something else too, is that you never heard anybody utter that phrase out loud. It would be written in a schedule, it was written in the judging manual, but nobody said, I'm going to make an arrangement on the Oriental Manor for the for the next Saturday show. If they said anything, they said, I'm going to make an Oriental. And there is a difference between using the word Oriental as an adjective and using the word Oriental as a noun. And using it as a noun can be offensive to Asian people. In fact, one of my Ikebana colleagues who hails from Singapore told me that in no uncertain terms, <laughs> that she didn't like that at all. Oh, big deal. Pardon? Anyway, why do we pick East Asian? Well, what we're working with really is Ikebana. So why is it an Ikebana? And we had a uh, arrangement judges meeting in San Diego a few years ago, and people liked the idea, let's call it Ikebana, but they found out that there was a minority that objected to that on the ground said Ikebana exhibitions are not judged, which is true. I've participated in them, I've seen them. Frankly, I will be very hard pressed to judge any of those exhibitions because the quality is so high. It would be hard to see how you could give anybody a lesson in first place for anything, quite frankly. But interestingly enough, my Ikebana colleagues don't seem to matter. So yeah, we don't judge them, but if, if another organization judges them, 
I don't necessarily care. But anyway, we've, we've struggled to find another term. I posited Far Eastern, somebody said, well, that's not so good either. And actually, again, it was one of my Ikebana colleagues who uh, is associated with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So why not call it East Asian? That's what we call the collection of the museum. And universities have uh, departments of East Asian studies when they're talking about the culture of China, Japan, and Korea. I said, okay, East Asian it is then. Uh, this chapter was extensively rewritten. You know, it was rewritten by me, and Ikebana is my thing. And somebody suggested maybe it was a little too long. Perhaps it is. Um, but I also think this subject is probably the least understood of the three major styles. Uh, the chapter as it existed was written really from the viewpoint of one of the Ikebana schools, namely the Ikenobo school. Uh, I thought that that did not necessarily give the full range of what the what the style was about, and really the Ikenobo styles or types of arrangements are really only understood by people who study Ikenobo. So I expanded it. I talked about the other two schools that are common in the United States, O'Hara and Sogets. Uh, along with just general material, recognizing the fact that most of our judges and exhibitors probably aren't affiliated with any of these schools. But I tried to explain in a little more detail what it was all about. And I also cited uh, websites for the various schools and Ikebana International and some Facebook pages where people can go for more information if, if they are, are interested. So this brings us now into the administrative section and gets to be kind of a legalistic and a lot of stuff going on here. So let's forge ahead. Chapter 15 is show schedules for arrangements. First of all, we were careful to define what the role of the district chair is for reviewing the schedules for the shows in the district. And mainly the job is to review the schedules for compliance with ARS rules and guidelines. And if they're not in compliance, they need to uh, inform the show committee so that they can be brought into compliance. The district chair can suggest other improvements to the schedules, but uh, can't mandate them. Uh, it is now recommended that there be one class per style for an average show and maybe more for larger shows. I think the previous edition said two classes per style. But this is an acknowledgement of where we are at the moment is that the shows are fewer and smaller and trying to recommend or demand something which is not achievable at the moment is uh, probably not a good idea. We do suggest that chairs with the lowercase c for judges the miniature arrangements that are on standard tables. Otherwise, the judge standing is looking at him from the wrong angle. If you know me, you know that I'm well over six feet tall and even sitting in a chair, sometimes I, I have trouble seeing a small arrangement at the proper level. So that's it, definitely a good idea. It was also suggested that the schedule include contact information for, for someone who would be at the show who could be contacted in case of there was an emergency that required that an exhibitor or judge be uh, notified during the show. I would say also for the for the show chair to know if a, a judge is held up in a traffic jam or something and is going to be late getting to the show. It's it's always good to know rather than one be wondering where somebody is. Now this chapter includes rules that have to be printed in every schedule. So there are some additions and modifications to the rules. Uh, one modification is that says the American exhibition names are to be written on the tag. We talked about that. It says AJ must be marked to be eligible for a certificate, and we add or any other award requiring a ranger grown roses. That would include trophies and challenge classes that are not eligible for certificates, but still require a ranger grown roses. And there's also the stipulation that the arrangement may not have been exhibited in a previous show. We talked about that with dried uh, for fresh arrangements. 
Yeah, moving them around from show to show, they're not may not hold up too well. But if you were very lucky, maybe an arrangement that you made for Saturday might show up, still show on Sunday, but probably not. But it, still, we're saying that you can only exhibit it and arrange it once. Also on there, the there are causes for severe penalties that were listed, and then there are some additions to, the, to that that we've talked about. Uh, first of all, it says that you can't use any plan on the state con conservation list. And added a note to that that say that some venues do not allow any instances of invasive species on their site as well. Now, whether or not you would you would uh, relegate an arrangement for using an invasive species, I guess we left that a little vague. But I can tell you that if you have a Hawkeye person from the venue seeing uh, an invasive species uh, in, in an arrangement, the arrangement might be end up being, or part of it might be penalized in a trash bag. There's some, some venues, botanic gardens in particular, are very fussy about that. I'm going to say that no flags of any kind are allowed, either national, state, or organizational. Abstraction of a rose bloom other than drawing it for a dry arrangement or craft. Nonconformance with the requirements for the special classes that we've gone over. Use of non miniature or mini floors and miniature classes. But when you get down to actual out and out disqualification, there's no changes, only the, uh, the two aspects roses not outdoor grown or use of artificial plant material. Uh, chapter 16 is American Rose Society Arrangement Awards, et cetera. Uh, we, first of all, we reiterate that when an arrangement scores 90 plus, that has to be noted on a tag and, and signed by a judge when the arrangement does not receive first place. The uh, higher awards are listed again, including the causes for penalization. No point in going over them again. We list three firm requirements for metal certificates. Uh, two of them, I think we've always, always known that the arrangement must have won first place in its class with 92 points or more, and that the roses must be outdoor arranger grown and AG marked on the tag. And we're also saying now that the roses must be correctly named with the AEN or an accepted synonym. The requirement for correct naming was always there, but to my knowledge, it was buried in a, in a paragraph rather than list, listed as a bullet point as it is now. And it wasn't necessarily enforced. So at some point when an arrangement is considered for a certificate, it should be verified that the, that the naming on it is acceptable. For the national trophies, again, the list of requirements, there must be an ARS member re registered for the convention, that's the same. Arrangement must score 92 points or more, that's the same. Roses must be outdoor arranger grown with AG Mark, that's the same. Only miniatures and mini floors and miniature classes, that's the same. We're saying correct American exhibition name or synonym must be written on the tag and judges must verify. So once again, correct naming was listed in the paragraph but not pulled it out, but we're saying if you want to win a national trophy, you need the correct name on it. it. It should be easier to have a correct name now that we're not worrying about synonyms or roses whose names are changed and so forth. So you have to really have the wrong name of the rose on the tag to, to, to not qualify here. And if you grow the rose, you should know what it is. It, it was the mindset that we had. And saying that the judges must verify this, uh, probably the simplest way to do it is that, that when the uh, when the winning uh, arrangement is determined, you can check on the names to be sure it's correct. And if they're not, then, then go down to the the next highest arrangement that qualifies. But otherwise, uh, if a judge spots a, a, a misnaming while while scoring the arrangements, they could point that out to the to the judging chair. Uh, it's possible you could go over the whole class and, and try and verify the names before judging, but I, I think that might be too much work if you just manage to catch it after the fact. Now, the three miniature net, uh, arrangement trophies, the Satterley, the Moore, and the Walters, were left at, at the 10 inch maximum height, width, and depth because that was the, uh, that's how they were determined when the, when the uh, 
when the classes were, when the trophies were donated for the classes and we thought that uh, it would not be our province to change that. We did add the new Barrel of Shoop trophy, which was awarded for the first time now in Milwaukee. And we stipulate that apprentice judges point score for discussion with their mentors only. So uh, the idea is, is that if the if the apprentice judge really makes a mistake in an arrangement, it's not going to penalize the arranger. Uh, chapter 17, Guidelines for the Arrangement Chair of National Shows. Uh, it's The old chapter said the arrangement chair was appointed by the convention chair. We're saying it could be appointed by the show chair who might know individuals better than the convention chair who has plenty of other things to do. That's a, that's a minor change and you know if it were done some other way I'm sure nobody would be upset. Uh, if there are a number of applicants to, to judge then judges can be appointed to be standby in case somebody cancels or and also remove the provision that the number of classes entered by one arranger could be limited. And I suggest instead that good judgment be used when the number of registrants exceeds space. Again, this is a recognition that there simply aren't as many arrangements being entered these days. You know, somebody has a lot of arrangements they'd like to enter and the classes aren't full, why should they not do it? Uh, good judgment means that, you know, say if there are six people that want to arrange in, in a class where there are five spaces, uh, the person who's entering a lot might be asked to, to not enter that class, or if there's room space because the other cla other adjacent classes are full, maybe the class could be expanded to, uh, to hold all six arrangements. And note again that there can be no limit on the number of entries for the national trophy classes. And we say that judging teams finishing their assignments early can be asked to judge additional classes that were uh, assigned to teams that were running behind. That's just in the interest of efficiency and in getting the judging done. Chapter 18 guidelines for judging arrangements at national shows. The previous edition said six teams of three judges would be deemed sufficient for most shows. Yeah, 18 judges. We don't need 18 judges these days. 12, in fact, we are lucky to have 12. So it could be six teams of two, it could easily be four teams of three if you had 12 judges and not so many arrangements. Uh, the book still says that an additional team is suggested when there are more than 200 entries. And you see my editorial comment that that'll be the day. Uh, the first national show I attended and judged in horticulture, that is, that is was at uh, Palm Springs in 2009. And I think there were definitely over 200 arrangements in that show. But since then, in any show I've attended, and that's that's uh, the fall shows in the next two years. And, the, and then from the time I joined the board of directors, I think I've been to every national show. There have been nowhere near 200 entries, usually less than 100. So. Uh, we just simply don't need it as many judges and why, why suggest or require it. Uh, if you have teams of two, you might be concerned about a disagreement. You can always do what horticulture does and, and just borrow a judge from another team or the judging chair to come in and resolve a disagreement. Uh, the medal certificates, either all the accredited judge can, can pick them or a designated judge from each team. There was a reference to appointing a team captain that hardly seems necessary if you have a team of two, but you can do it if you like. Uh, so if you have apprentice judges, they would probably be judging with two other accredited judges, but one of them would be designated as the better and evaluating judge. Maybe that would be the team captain. Uh, novice and junior classes, the judges can be lenient if only local awards are given, but if ARS awards are given, then they have to adhere to ARS judging standards. And it's requirement that there should be no judge discussion with other judges when scoring the national challenge classes. Chapter 19 is responsibility for arrangement judges. 
this is another item that we put in that, that is maybe a little controversial, but it's actually been done in some districts, so we might as well put it in the book. And that if the show committee permits, judges may enter an open class, that is to say something other than a judge's class, that they are not assigned a judge. Uh, that's been done in places simply because the, with fewer shows and fewer arrangers, the judges themselves have fewer opportunities to, to enter arrangements and fewer, and fewer opportunities to judge. So by doing that, the, the judge is hopefully not compromising themselves. And now if the judge's arrangement happens to to win and it's going to be evaluated for a higher award, then the, that judge has to step back. Now this could be complicated in terms of logistics, but uh, I call your attention to the phrase that the show committee permits. So that has to be handled on a local basis as to whether or not this will be allowed. Okay, chapter 20, training and accrediting roles arrangement judges. Uh, first of all, candidates who have not previously passed horticulture judging school or responsible for determining that a horticulture school will be available within one year of, of the arrangement school or actually within one year after being notified that you've passed the arrangement school. Uh, what we don't want is a situation where some, somebody who needs a hort school passes the arrangement school and then discovers that there, there's no art school that they can attend within a year and ask for more time, which could be problematic. Also applicable to that is apprentices who have not yet passed the art school may apprentice judge no more than two shows of the five required apprentice judging uh, occasions. I, I think, you know, it's fairly clear that if we consider uh, passing the horticulture school very important so that an arrangement judge can properly evaluate the perfection of the roses on the arrangement that they really need to do a significant portion of their arrangement uh, after having done so and having that uh, knowledge. It's maybe unlikely, but it's not inconceivable that if somebody were taking a horticulture school near the end of the one year, that they could somehow cram in five uh, apprentice judging occasions as an arrangement judge prior to that, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, the apprentice judge must have received 90 plus scores for a total of three arrangements earned over two, at least two shows. Uh, this, this was a correction that was already made. The, uh, the previous edition of the guidelines simply said that uh, the apprentice had to have earned three ribbons or certificates. And our belief was that the word blue was omitted from that because three ribbons could be three fourth place ribbons. Uh, so what are we actually looking for? We're looking for a, a certain talent for arranging that says that, that the apprentice can make an arrangement worthy of a blue ribbon absent any competition, not that they necessarily have to receive a blue ribbon in a class that's very, very competitive, if, if that's clear. But so this is one of the reasons why we're asking the judges now to mark 90 plus on the signature on, on the uh, entry tags for any arrangement in that situation that doesn't receive a first in the event that uh, it may have been placed by an apprentice. The evaluation forms may be sent in by either the mentor judge or the apprentice. It's desirable that the mentor judge sits down with the, with the apprentice right after the judging is complete and goes over the form with them, fills it out, and lets the apprentice know how they, how they did. And the form can be given to the apprentice and to make a copy of to send in. We don't really care if the mentor could, could cares to send it in as long as the apprentice is, is aware of what their evaluation was. Uh, finally here, accredited judges are expected to judge three shows in a four year period and enter arrangements in two shows when judges classes are okay for that. 
that's a reduction in the numbers again simply because of the fact that there just aren't as many shows these days also on chapter 20 are the the audit requirements um, arrangement judges are required to obtain four hours credit for attending a seminar or workshop or school as an auditor instructor in a four-year period no change there we are saying that online seminars like we're doing right at this moment count toward the four hours so you get two hours credit for this uh, we are, are saying that the four hours don't have to be obtained all at once so we do say that the four hours must include an in-person seminar of at least one hour with discussion of actual arrangements because there's nothing like looking at a real arrangement arrangements are three-dimensional pictures are two-dimensional you can't really get a good impression of the quality of, of an arrangement simply by looking at a photo especially if the photo's not properly taken like from the wrong angle for instance so you're not really seeing the arrangement as it should be viewed chapter 21 guidelines for the district arrangement chair it used to say there should be a school in the, in the district every two years now we're saying well schools should be scheduled at times when candidates are available that, that's i think is what's been happening anyway so why should the guidelines say otherwise the the annual report of activities by judges is now optional it's not mandatory i think that really whether or not that's done depends on how many judges there are in a, in a given district. Some districts have only a handful of judges and whoever is district chair probably knows very well what the other judges have been doing. So why, why bother putting it down on paper? But North Central has a lot of judges, Pacific Southwest has a lot of judges. So maybe, maybe a written note would be more appropriate there, but that's at the discretion of the uh, district chairs. Chapter 22, Arrangement Seminar and Workshop. The National Chair will inform the District Chair how many hours of credit will be awarded to participants. We do say the time should be allotted for participants to raise issues and concerns and for other questions like we're going to do uh, in a very short time now. And this is another response to a problem. Attendance sheets must be sent to headquarters and no credit will be given to the judges. Uh, one district was holding regular seminars, but they weren't sending the attendance sheets in. And that was a problem for me. It was a problem for Carol. It was a problem for the judges. So we're saying you do have to have attendance sheets and they must be sent to headquarters for, for getting credit. And your attendance is being recorded uh, today for, for this webinar. So finally, that brings us to arrangement judging school. We're saying now that it's required rather than recommended that the guidelines be reviewed by participants prior to the school. Why not? You're going to school, you, you can't absorb everything from a lecture. You really should have spent some time reading through the, reading through the guidelines before you go to a school. We're saying that the written exam can be given either at the end of the first day or on the second day prior to the practical. I think it's good to give it at the end of the first day when material is fresh, although people may be a little tired. But if you do it on the end of the first day, they can either be graded on the spot or overnight. And before the students do the practical, they can know that they passed the, the written exam. The next one is a little controversial, whether the written exam should be closed book or optionally open book. Ultimately, there was a unanimous decision to make a closed book with 70% required to pass. Uh, in horticulture, judging the written exam has always been closed book. Uh, the argument for open book is that there's, there's a lot of detail and admittedly that's true, but open book can be abused. Somebody could sit with a book for two or three hours looking up the answer to every question. That's simply not acceptable we talked about saying well you could have an open book but you had to have a strict time limit and a higher score to pass eventually that went out and said no it's it's closed book period with 70 percent required to pass and it really should not be difficult to get 70 percent 
the practical exam, we did put in more information as to how that should be conducted and saying that the practical exam should consist of five or more arrangements, three standard, two miniature. They should include at least one arrangement from each major style, traditional, modern, East Asian. And the instructors and the students each will point score and comment on their deductions for each of the arrangements. And the students are graded by a conformance of their comments and, and scores with those of the instructors. And again, 70% required to pass. Uh, it's nice that the instructors can grade the exams at the school if possible. They still have to be approved by the national chair. I only was aware of two schools during the, the term when I was national chair, and I happened to be president of both of them. So we did essentially do the grading on site, and I could uh, I could bless them on site. So you know, we could tell some very relieved students that they had passed without making them uh, wait for a period of time to hear the news. So that is the end of what is in the book. There is one other item that's going to be uh, a separate download and you probably can't see this. <laughs> I can barely see it on my computer at this size, but this is a, a table of the arrangement awards. I made this up as an Excel sheet and used it as a handout and tried to make it fit. And I do have to thank Marianne Rink who we we'll spent some time formatting it so that it prints nicely on an eight and a half by 11 sheet uh, of paper so that it could be a, a carry around, especially if you uh, printed it on heavier stock and maybe even laminated it and you have a, a quick guide to, to everything you need to know about, about the awards. But if, if you look at that, <laughs> you can see why some of our students are, are baffled when they, when they first get involved with that. So I've talked for about an hour. We have another hour to go for questions or until we run out of questions. And I'm, I'm going to open up the, uh, the seminar for that. All right, thank you so much, Craig. Okay, so if you have a question for Craig, you can, this is definitely the time to do that. To the right of your screen, you will see an attendees pod. Um, you'll see a little hand there. If you have a question for Craig, please click on that hand and that will notify me that you have a question. I will call your name. Once I call your name, please make sure your phone is on mute so you can ask Craig your question. All right, so the first person will be Julie Goggin. Julie, you'll need to unmute yourself. Please cancel that question. I, I clicked the hand by mistake. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Carol or Jerry Macon? You'll need to unmute Carol or Jerry. Okay, um, Elaine Adler. Unmute. Elaine, are you there? You need to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Pat Bilson. I'm with Elaine Adler, and I just wanted to say that we're viewing this program together. Uh, nice program. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Lane, who did you say you're viewing the program with? Pat Bilson, B-I-L-S-O-N. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Gwen Quayle. Gwen, do you have a question for Craig? Okay. Craig, can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay, yeah. Folks, okay. there's an orange button that with a microphone on and on your on your uh, control pad that you should see. That's what you have to click that to unmute yourself. All 
right, so we're gonna uh, move to Jackie Nye. Hi there. Um, for the apprentice judging, um, you need to, how long or how far back from your school do you have to have arrangements that uh, were 90 plus in a show? Yeah, Jackie, that was ambiguous at one time, too, and it was sort of suggested that you had to get those while you were an apprentice, but what it says now is that any time anytime while you're an apprentice or before, so if you hit, you know, as long as you have a tag that's, that's punched for a first, that would be good, good enough. Thank God I've saved them. Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, Catherine, but Catherine Button. Hi, this is Kathy. You answered my question in the chat about if we could get a copy of the slides. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, Paula Williams. Hello, you can hear me? Yes. No. Um, yeah, I think one of them answered my question too. When we would this would be available that we could get a copy of this and. Um, Will that be on the ARS website? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Okay, because I really want to see that present uh, arrangement award table a little bit larger so I can check that out. Yeah, I think they can put that up at any time at this point, so because that's separate from the from the book. Oh, okay, cool. And um, will we get an email with our credit for this presentation? Oh. Uh, I can't answer that. I guess that would be up to uh, Carol or Kim. Okay. Um, I'll, actually, I'll let Carol we do, actually, we send the uh, attendee list to the district chairs and then they credit you with it. Okay, so we're just automatically credited if we were on here, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And thanks for doing this. you okay Lori Emery all right thank you Craig for an excellent program I have a question about uh, 2020 when we had the COVID disaster there wasn't an opportunity to go to a horticulture school and is that going to give us any kind of an extension because of that yeah, certainly while I was chair, and it really goes back to Bob Martin, too, when he was president, and he said that that uh, 2020 was a year that never happened. And right. I think a lot of us, 2021 is a year that never happened, because a lot, because uh, in, in my district, there were no physical shows in, until September. Uh, the All the spring shows were virtual. And, you know, you, you could sort of judge virtually, but it's, it's not the same. So, so definitely 2020 didn't count. So if, if anybody was up for an audit, if they were up, up for extending their apprenticeship or anything else, it didn't count as far as I was concerned. Okay. And so I assume for 2022, there will be some horticulture classes available. Yeah, but of course that's, that's up to the, to the, uh, to the horticulture judging people to uh, to do that, but I would I would say that they're likely to be somewhere because it's 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 going to be a while now that that they've had any sort of school. So, right. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Jerry Mahoney. Hi. Uh, because we start our show schedule out here in April, like the first week of April. Will this be up online relatively soon so that we can make sure people can reference it when they're writing their show schedules for the spring? Because I have two show schedules I'm getting ready to start writing right now. Um, yeah, Craig, we I can... would, Go ahead. So I would, I would be very disappointed if we didn't have this out 
well before April. Now, in terms of right, you know, Jerry, you are on the committee. I can send you the text, and you can always work with the text. Perfect. You, you know. Yeah, that'll that'll work. I I just you know we the holidays come and then we're in January and we're pruning and busy busy and all of a sudden it's February and the schedules aren't done and for us out here and because I have several rose societies that have shows in the spring and I need to remind them that they have to have their schedules reviewed this year because of the changes um, I really feel like I needed to get a copy of it but if you can send me the text that'd be perfect yeah you don't need the illustrations for that i, I mean no. uh, emily and beth were going to help with cleaning up files and and so forth and and graphics for the cover and the, the things i listed and, and you know that i could deal with numbering the paper pages and, and making an index once i i know how many more pages are going to go in uh, right you, you know we work our staff terribly hard and I'm very grateful for all their efforts and, and you know there there are other priorities like getting the annual to the printer that, that oh, come yeah. up and then well, Christmas and Roseland so uh, so yeah. I'm not pointing any fingers at anyone but but you know I would I'm, I'm waiting for their help yeah and and they are incredibly busy and do a yeoman's job with everything so um, I can't say enough good stuff about what they do, the work they do. So, yeah, if I can get a copy of the text, that'll be great. And I know the slides are going to be up in about a week, so I can use those for the people right. that, that were actually judging a rose show today. <laughs> so six of my 19 judges are off judging a rose show today and could not attend. So they, they were concerned about seeing the update. So they can look at that when it comes up online. Thank you. Yep. William Black. Yes, uh, uh, Jerry, I was just curious when y'all were discussing the size for miniature arrangements, has there ever been any discussion about the suitability of mini floors continuing as material for miniature arrangements since they keep getting bigger and bigger each year? Well, there's some of them that I think are clearly too big for a miniature arrangement. Uh, they can go up to three inches diameter. That's unless you have an arrangement that used only one, say, you know, modern or or an East Asian. Uh, right. You, you know, I, I would say in a sense that's why we have a Duke class because it, then you can put those bigger mini floors in, in the Duke class. Um, okay. Now I was just curious because as you mentioned to me, um, the mini floors are progressing to becoming basically single stem floor abundas, which are grouped with the large roses. So right. it's, it's a three. It's kind of that. Oh, it's a weird category. It almost doesn't fit in either uh, section anymore. You, you know, I'll be the devil's advocate and say, well, well why we stricted the miniatures and mini floors when there are, are some shrubs that have and and even old garden roses that have small blooms, you know, and rose to rush that's no bigger than a mini floor. I can think of some shrubs that are no bigger than mini floors. What about polyanthus, you know, if you could if you could yeah. accommodate a spray in an arrangement, you know, so should it should it be should it be classification or should it be size? And you, you know, that's a question that's never never been discussed. Okay. No, I just appreciate it. I was just curious. Yep. Paula Williams. Uh, yes, I've already uh, got my question answered. Thank you. All right, Lauren Top. Lauren, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, Craig. This is Lauren. Hi, will Lauren. The, will the arrangement judging test be updated at any point in time, or has it been updated? Yeah, good point. Uh, the the written test we're using is one that Nancy wrote, and I did take a look at it and and went through it and made changes to to bring it up to date with with the changes in the guidelines. There there weren't a whole lot of them, but there were some. And I forget what I did with it, but I guess I had to send it to Norma and uh, 
and, and see that we be sure that the revision gets out the next time we have a school. And I have one other comment here. So based on what you were telling us about uh, certificate winners and assuming that there's more than one uh, class in a section, say there's three winners in the modern section. Right. And they're all, you know, there's three winners that are, well, they're 92 and plus and they're AG, but they did not, two of the three did not win the modern award, the artist, artist award. In my opinion, and what I'm understanding you to say, it's still eligible to be, to be considered for a certificate. And it could still win over the arrangement that won the award since the other arrangement teams may not have had judged that section at all and never saw the arrangements. And now they're looking at these arrangements, say, an hour later. Am I, yeah, am I, am I correct? You're, you're correct. I mean, if you have three modern classes, the, the, the winners, you have three winners, and assuming they're, they're AG and 92 and correctly named, they could be your gold, silver, bronze, and the other, you know, the other styles uh, could not get any of those. So, but only one of those would would have the the uh, artist award, which should have gone to the the highest scoring arrangement if you point scored it at the time when they were judged. And you're correct that an hour later, maybe something has changed. And when you do the certificates, which is the last thing you award, it, it could be somewhat different. I mean, the same thing. Same thing happens uh, in horticulture, right? You pick your you pick your uh, blue ribbon winners, but by the time you put them up to judgment for queen, something has changed, and what have been best at one point maybe still isn't. So I've butted heads with judges in my district over this, where they insisted that they could not be considered because they did not win the award. No, it it never states anywhere in either the previous edition or this one that you had to have won the rosette to be eligible for a certificate. I guess I wasn't good at debate because I could not convince them and I was over, always overrun because I was one of three in a team. No, I mean, your statement was, was right. If you have three classes of the same style and they're the three best arrangements overall, that are that are aging 92 and correctly named and those are your gold silver bronze okay well i i I'm, i guess i'm feeling better that at least i was reading the guidelines in the past and in now and present uh, correctly thank you very much craig great presentation thank you um linda boland I think perhaps I'm still a little confused with that. Craig, do you think you could print that up for us in something that's very concise with the what gets gold, silver, and bronze? You're, are you saying that, say for instance, in the modern class, I could have extra blue ribbon winners that didn't win the artist award and I would be looking at them. Well, you do, you have to, as you can see, I am confused. Would you just type that up in a sentence and send it out? I, so I, I suppose I can do that. Uh, I'd have to have headquarters send it out because I don't have a mailing list for all the arrangement judges, but but yeah, that, I, I assume that could be done. Let's let's put it this way: the rosettes, like the the royalty, the artist, the East Asian princess, duchess, and so forth, are independent of the certificates. Because number one, you don't have to be a ranger grown to win one of the rosettes. Correct. You just have to have you just have to have won the class and be 92 points to to uh, to be to to get the certificate. You need to have one one year class. You need to be 92 or above. You need to be correctly named. Now, if you have only one class for modern, one one class for traditional, one class for East Asian, you know the best one of those, assuming they meet all the all the qualifications, 
Yeah, they're going to have the rosettes on when you're going to get along with any of the others that are eligible when you're going to pick the certificates from those. But if you have a big show, or if you have, like Lauren was saying, say a modern a modern division with three classes in it, then it's conceivable that those could be the three best overall for the certificates, even though only the best of the best, as it were, got the got the artist award. Do you have a follow-up question for, for Craig? <laughs> I only had that question when we're standing there fussing because somebody says you can't do it and somebody else says you can do it like Lauren. Um, I, I know that if you have two classes in the artist and um, you have two blue ribbons because you had two classes and That's one right. is the artist award, but that other blue ribbon, if it's a, a ranger grown, is also eligible when you start picking your metal certificates. That's exactly right. So that's, uh, okay, the question is, if in the class that won the artist award, there are 90 plus blue ribbons there, but they don't have a blue ribbon. They've got a red ribbon stuck on them because they you can't have two blue, blue ribbons in a class. You're not saying that those three blues in that class that won the artist award are eligible for the certificate. No, you, you still have to, there's only one first place, even if you, you know, being being 90 points or better doesn't doesn't assure you of a blue ribbon if something else scores higher. So, these, so it, yeah, you know, maybe that's unfair. Maybe 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 your artist award is worthy of the gold certificate, and, and maybe you've got the the second place one there is so good that it might be the second best arrangement overall. But in that case, unfortunately, it's out of luck. Right. It didn't right. Okay. okay. But my point is, when you're looking back at the sections, and now the uh, one that arranged the arrangement that won the artist award, maybe it had two roses, and now one is blown or totally gone bad, and you can't, you know, automatically say since it won the artist, I'm going to give it a, a certificate. That's that's correct too. I mean, basically, you rescore, you redo. That's it. correct, and I've I've been overridden on multiple occasions saying no you have to win an award to be considered and we don't consider these and if we do we're not going to even go with it because the since the award winner won with a higher score than the other two blue ribbon winners in that section um it's still better arrangement even though it's drooping and falling apart or <laughs> something moved or whatever and the other teams never saw it that in its perfection right well that's and, and you're not having just the one team that originally judged it. You're having you're having judges from all the teams, so they look at Correct. it. Correct. Right. I, I as, as I look at it now, I don't see that this is you know the artist award winner. Um, I'm just bringing it up because I've personally seen it happen on more than one occasion here in the PSWD. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Jerry Mahoney posted a question in the chat pod. So are all blue ribbons that are AG, are they eligible for metal certificates? Uh, no, because the judge's class is not eligible. The dried classes are ineligible. They're for classes with, with fresh roses. All right. Uh, Ellie, I I'm sorry, go ahead, Craig. If I go back up to this table, then I don't know whether you, you know if you if you squint to see it, but but uh, there is a column that says GSB certificate eligible, and you know any, anything with a um, second, third, or fourth place ribbon is not the, uh, the keepsake and rosecraft are not the the judges and personal adornments are not. The the mini keepsake and the mini rosecraft are not, and the uh, 
and the, the, the national trophy classes or not when you have a national show. All right. Uh, Linda Boland. I've already I've already asked my question. Thank you. Okay. Let me put your hand down. Uh, Nancy Reddington. Hi. Um, one of the things that has been a lot very helpful because this problem with do they get the award? Do they not? It comes up a lot. And I make a suggestion, and one thing that we've done is when the class is judged, we either have the team write the point score on the appropriate piece of paper that we have there or on the reverse side. So therefore, you've gotten over that 92 barrier. So there is only one blue, and to have any higher award, you've got to have more than 92. Not 92, move it off the docket has to be a ranger grown for some. Those, that's the certificates. That's why that's the last one in the doc. The other one, now you go to the certificates. Again, it's the award. And then, but we have different pieces of paper or a ledger sheet that says this particular arrangement is 92 or better. It is the first place winner in the class. It is a G. So that, kind of elimination stuff tends to unconfuse the issue. Craig, you're doing a great job. Fantastic. That's all I can say. You made our work perfect. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Uh, Ellie Long Logannecker. Hi. Hey, Ellie. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead and ask her your question. Well, uh, two things. My friend and apprentice judge, Cherry Hoover, has a question, and she's on her phone, and she texted me. And her question is, uh, we're in Northern California. Um, what do you do if a florist-grown arrangement is the only entry in that class? A florist-grown. It's display only. You can't judge it can't be judged. It's not only that it can't get a first, but is it technically DQ'd? The roses have to be outdoor garden grown. Okay. Okay. So my other question is um, when I signed up, uh, there was no, we're in Northern California, Nevada, Hawaii district. Our district wasn't listed. So Cherry and I just both wanted to know that we were going to get credit for the course. And she wasn't on the email, so I forwarded her, her the link. And she's been watching today. So we're just trying to verify that the, the credit's being tracked. Right. You should be on the attendance list because that's that's compiled by the software, as I recall. So I what, I am because I signed up, but I had to forward the link because she's not getting she's not on your email. Um What's her name? No, just check. Cherry Hoover. She's an apprentice judge. You said she's watching? Yes. Something's going on with our sound. Are you there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You got kind of noisy. Anyhow, um, I think you answered our question, or maybe we should call our local uh, arrangement chair just to confirm that we attended. I have a printout from signing up, but um, she was having a hard time getting online. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay, thank you. Jamie Roberts. All right, uh, Jerry Mahoney. Um, yeah, I'm just making sure that I'm on the same page. So I'm understanding, Craig, from what you told me, that if they are a ranger grown, blue ribbons, not the dried, not the those specialty ones, but the ones that are inclusive in that gold, silver, bronze 
category, all the blue ribbons are eligible for gold, silver, bronze. As long as they meet the, the qualifications, yes. Right, okay. Yeah, because I, I have also struggled with that with a certain couple of judges here in the Pacific Southwest District and um, been on that same uh, issue with, you know, when, that Lauren talked about trying to convince people that they really were incorrect and rather than create a huge issue, you end up compromising because you don't want to have an incident <laughs> at the Rose Show, but it, it really is incorrect to to do it the other way. So thank you very much for clarifying that. I think that'll be a huge help. And if you send that statement out that uh, they ask that you type it out, that would be hugely helpful because that will go out to the arrangement judges um, as a separate thing for them to be aware of that they need to change their mindset on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll try to get that at least to the the district chairs and uh, I don't know who is the district chairs now because that's that's not my job. Uh, right. But but, send it to Norma or, or, or maybe Kim or Carol can send it out. Right and um, well and like for Pacific Southwest District that would be me so yeah. um, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah you know in, in a perfect world the best the best arrangement in each of the styles would be the the royalty the artist the the east asian but uh that, that's not to say that those are the three best overall that's that's what we're saying all all, all along because it really depends on the strength of the of the class exactly so i appreciate it thank you very much mm -hmm. Now, what Nancy said is is another thing too, is that you could just have slips of paper that if it, when they're initially judged, if the judges determine that it's properly named, that it's, that it's 92 plus it's Ranger Grown and it's got the blue ribbon, you can just have a slip of paper that says GSB, gold, silver, bronze, and, and leave it on the uh, table next to the arrangement so that, that when people come around to pick the certificates, they, they know if that particular one's eligible. It's a good I thought. I know I've done on national shows. All right, so Craig, we have a question from the chat from uh, Gwen Quayle. She says, "Roses that look like the ones you can buy at a florist. How can a judge determine that and then eliminate the entry by not judging it?" Well, you, you know. Basically, it's an honor system. But I will say this about florist roses: you go and buy half a dozen roses from from a florist. They're they're all at the same stage of bloom. They're basically buds, or partially open buds. And if, if you look at a, an arrangement that's supposed to have a gradation of bloom in it, like essentially any traditional arrangement. Uh, if all the roses are the same stage of bloom, you know, barely open buds, uh, <laughs> that would that would ring an alarm bell with me. Uh, you, you know, when we have seminars in the winter and that's the only kind of roses we can get, that's fine. That's for practice, but uh, that would set it off. But you know, ultimately, it's an honor system. It is in horticulture too. The roses are supposed to co come from your garden and your garden only. Where's the proof? There isn't any. It's an honor system. So uh, if something raises suspicions, yeah, you know, the other, of course, in a lot of arrangements, you don't see the stem of foliage, but you get roses from a florist. There's usually not much foliage on it, and it's often in bad shape most of the time, not all the time. So that, that would be another hint, too. But ultimately, it's an honor system. So she has a follow-up question, Craig. She says, but what if there is a mix of outdoor and questionables? Well, using any any roses that are definitely not outdoor garden grown, then that's that's disqualification. That's one of the two points. So it doesn't matter whether it's it's one out of it it's it's one rose or ten roses, if they're not outdoor garden grown, then it's not allowed. All right, Jackie Nye. 
Good. Um, my other question is, uh, any idea when the next uh, arrangement school is? Uh, we can talk about that because I know I know somebody else who wants one too. So we can talk about that. All right. That's a local issue. So. Yeah. Now, also, <laughs> um, just another question um, uh, to piggyback everything else. I, you know, like on Rose Chive, Facebook, all over the place, a lot of people grow in their gardens florist roses. Yeah, that's okay. As long as they're outdoor garden growing, you know, if you grow Leonides, that's that's fine. You know, uh, there, there are others. That I think Hot Princess is another one, Cardinals one. I think those were florist roses initially. There's no problem as long as they're out, grown outdoors in a garden. And they but have if a... They came out of, if they came out of a hothouse... Or they came from Ecuador, and you don't know how or how or why they, how they were grown or where they were grown. Uh, you know that's that's where the problems come in. Well, like you said, it also has to have an AEN. So, right. So you know the ones you pick right. up at Trader Joe's aren't going to have an AEN. That, that's right. I mean, somebody can make something up, but you know, if, if you look it up in the book and there's nothing there or, or the color is wrong or something, then, you know, you're not going to get away with it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. William Black? Uh, yes, Craig. Um, the one thing I noticed when people are trying to discuss with you about the suitability of gold medal, bronze, uh, gold medal, silver, bronze certificates, eligibility, I think some of the confusion is that people are forgetting about that not all blue ribbons are 92 plus. There are chances where they could be 90 or 91 where they would not be eligible. So when you take say, a blanket statement that all blue ribbons would be considered, that's not really accurate. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. You do have to be 92 and you could get a blue ribbon with a 90 or a 91. Okay, I think that needs to be a little, I don't know how to clarify it, but that needs to be emphasized because that has come up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Nancy Reddington. Uh, hi. I wanted to mention the other thing that we have done. I have run into the question of is it a garden grown rose? And I have asked to speak to the arrangement chair i've asked the arrangement chair to look at the name tag go out and ask them that they're garden grown and that's the simplest way to handle that if they don't know who the person is or they can't get in touch with them because it is an honor system but if it's causing that much if you're that go that step that's what your your chair is very helpful to do and then the question about the certificates the definition always was blue ribbon scoring 92 points or more Simple. If you have those two sets of things together, you really can't go too much further. It clarifies a lot if you say that right together. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions for Craig? If you have a question, please uh, click on the hand to the right of your screen in the control pod. Okay. Uh, Lauren, you have another question for Craig? Lauren back. Okay, um, back to that uh, 92 or better stuff. Um, my point also is even across different sections, there could be a winner in say the traditional section that had a 92 and got the uh, traditional uh, award. And then there could be two winners in the modern section that got 92 or better, and one was a 98 and one was a 96. And another winner that's in the uh, far e or eastern, far eastern area, and they got a 94 at the time of the original judging. I've also seen where, well, all automatically the one that got a 98 automatically got the gold, and the one that got a 90. Four got the silver, and the one that got 92 got the bronze without even going back to look at him again with all the judges. Yeah, my understanding is that is that there should be they should only be awarded by a panel of judges going going around. Number one, I, 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 
there might be disagreement by what the scores are because uh, you, you know I, I I think you've I I tallied the trophy classes more than once and it's surprising sometimes uh, the diversity of scores you see coming from even the accredited judges so somebody somebody can look at an arrangement and say I, I've literally seen this uh, that it's that it's a 94 and somebody will, will will come back, look at the same arrangement and say it's an 85. So. <laughs> but think... but Nancy's comment was to mark the score on the back of the card. And I just yeah. think it should be marked at as 92 plus and leave it at that well, and be rejudged. I, I would I would say that's fine with me too, because uh, n number one, uh, I, I know Nancy at least mentally point scores everything she she looks at but not all judges do that you can say yeah this is the best one this is the best one this is the best one when i judge i turn to my fellow judges i said is this better than 92 and they'll say yes or no and and, and leave it at that and i think a lot of judges do work that way so all you can really say at that point is say, yeah it's better than 92 92 or better i should say All right, uh, Richard Kirkhoff. Okay, am I clear? Yep. All right. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of obvious when you're talking about the mini mini flora. Um, those are to be used in the miniature um, classes. Um, but uh, I'm not seeing anything, uh, or maybe I'm missing it, uh, about prohibiting use of mini or mini floors in uh, uh, standard size rose arrangements. They're not prohibited. A standard arrangement, you can use any rose you like. And for that matter, if you can define the space, you, you could enter a, a 10 inch arrangement in a standard class, because there's, there's, there's usually no no lower limit on, on the size in those classes. Uh, I mean, the dupe class was, was specifically carved out for a smaller standard arrangement in the 20 to 10 to 20 inch range, but there's, but as I say, with, with appropriate backgrounds and underlays, you could you could define a smaller space in any standard class. I mean, if you want to use polyanthus, I'll go back to that. They're tiny roses, but you can't put them in a miniature class. You can only put them in a standard. So, okay, great, thank you. Okay, Carol or Jerry Macon. You'll have to unmute yourself. If you click on the, there you go. Oh, there, I've got it. Thank you. Um, when will the changes be available on the on the website, the ARS website? When, whenever we get all the material I discussed together and get it in a publishable form, that's what I mean by publishing this. Is putting it on the website. So, All right. so yeah, we definitely want want there before spring, and spring comes early in the south and the southwest, and uh, you know, as as soon as we can get it done. Believe me, I want to get this done. I had hoped it would be done by now, but uh, that just didn't happen. Okay, we'll keep looking for it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Jerry Mahoney. Uh, my question got answered. Thank you very much for coming back around to, to that. But uh, we're just, I'm just figuring out the best way to implement some of this. <laughs> there, there's going to be resistance, Craig. I'm telling you, there will be. Um, that's well, in all things, there, there do seem to be some ur urban legends. Yes, yes. There are things yes. that have never been in the book at any time. But they get propagated. They are. Right. And they get yeah. passed down from, from person to person. And but it should be in black and white somewhere exactly what the situation is. Right. And um, you know, we'll just have to be persistent and um keep keep putting out the message that this is the way it's supposed to be, not the way you think you learned it. You have to unlearn that and learn it the right way. 
All right. So, Craig, we have another question from Gwen Quayle in the chat. She says, can you mix miniature and minifloral roses in the same miniature arrangement? Uh, short answer is yes. Okay. All right, Nancy Reddington. One of the things that I wanted to comment on, well, the combination is of the miniature mini floors, only if it's not stipulated that it cannot be. And the other thing I wanted to mention is what Lauren was talking about is the importance of when you are awarding any award is to go up to the arrangement you're talking about. There was an occasion that I witnessed where the team of judges giving the awards stood and pointed and said, now what, what about that one? What about this one? They did not go over. Consequently, they gave the gold to an arrangement that was not a ranger grown. You got to go back and double check. All right. Um, Ms. Macon, did you have another question? Carol Macon, did you have another question? No, I didn't turn the hand off. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll take it down for you. Okay, Jerry, do you have another question? Uh, no, I didn't. I took my hand down. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, so does anyone else have any other questions for, for Craig? We have about 10 more minutes left for questions. If so, please click on the hand to. Uh... All right. Mary Ann Rink. Mary, Mary Ann Rink, you'll need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Okay. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank Craig and Nancy both for all the work, the many hundreds of hours I know they've put into this. And I hope that all the judges, when the new manual is out, will take the time to sit down and read through the whole thing because the format is so vastly improved over what it was. Um, I think everybody will really like it. So anyhow, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. William Black. Yes, one final question, Craig. Um, this has just been something I've wondered over the years. Do you know why uh, personal adornment pieces are not considered for metal certificates? What the logic was way back when? Frankly, I don't. Uh, unless they were just more or less grouped with the with the drives, but they're usually they would be fresh roses, but uh, in, in a sense, they're not really arrangements because you know a boutonniere is what it's a flower and a leaf, basically. So that 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 may have been the may have been the reason. Okay. Something like that. No, there's three reasons I'm asking because like a formal a bouquet is actually even more work than uh, most arrangements per se. Right. So it seems kind of a shame that the, those cannot be considered. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that. That certainly predates me whenever that decision was made. So uh, if there's a veteran judge who knows, I, I would defer to them. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, Josephine Martin. Josephine, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yes, now I want to unmute myself. Am I okay? You're okay. All right. <clears throat> Dealing with the crafts, I think um, bouquets and uh, boutonnieres and things were always considered a craft area they are well done but uh, they're not in the design department so i think that's why they're not included thank you very much miss martin all right um laura emory 
I'm sorry, uh, Lauren Tuck. Uh, my last pet peeve here is uh, was underwater arrangements still going to be in the book about uh, under and moderns? Yes, they're there, and I think I think they're better defined. I I don't. Yeah, how a, are they going? How are they defined? You have. To, <laughs> I'll have to open up the uh, the book. Because I know in the past it was defined that at least what half of it the arrangement had to be underwater, and people took that to be fifty percent and no more and no less. And my take on it was a focal point should be underwater. At least one focal point should be underwater. Yeah. Hang on, I'm getting there. Okay. What it says, and I, I know Nancy had a lot to do with this, underwater designs must have a focal area of the design placed underwater in a clear or transparent container. Approximately one third of the design as a minimum should be underwater. The full design may be placed under the level of the water. It says, well, I gotta fix that. It says level of the water level. <laughs> the level of the water in the container may be specified or left up to the arranger. Okay, because the one third part is gonna be taken literally. But it's now she says one one third or more, correct? It says approximately. Approximately, okay. The design as the minimum should be underwater. Okay. All right. That sounds much better. Yep. I, I think I can live with that. Ms. Um, looks like I saw Lauren's hand up. I'm sorry, Nancy. There you go, Nancy. Yes, on the uh, level of the water too, Lauren. The reason I don't specify is because I've seen some interesting work done when the container is tipped. So therefore, we've left it up to the designer. We've left it up to the scheduler writer. But yes, Focal area must be under, that should be at least one third and up. Um, the other one wanted to comment on the underwater is that it was left in because it had been very popular. And we took the two definitions and combined them to make one. The other thing I want, what was what we just mentioned before, I've, I've forgotten it now already, but uh, it was another clarification on one of those. Yeah, so, okay, bye. Nancy. Ms. Macon, do you have another question? You raised your hand again. No? Okay. All right. Does anyone else have a question for Craig? We have about four minutes left. Mary Kaplan. Marie Kaplan. I'm sorry, Marie. Yes, uh, Greg, I still kind of confused. Uh, you mentioned about once you judge a section, something else maybe happen later and you have to come around again. Once this judge is not already judged and that's it. Okay, no, what, you know. What, Happen. If you're if you're awarded a blue ribbon, ninety two yeah. plus, and so at the time it's it's, it's judged, nobody's going to take that blue ribbon away. When they okay. come around, when they come around to look for rosettes or certificates, if something has happened, if it's changed, if it's run out of water, or something's drooping, it it doesn't look as good as it did at the time. Uh, that that might affect how how the the higher awards are given up, but nobody's going to take that blue room away. It's the same it's the same thing in horticulture. You know, you, you have some old garden rose that look, looks beautiful. It gets a blue ribbon and maybe even gets a dowager queen. You put it up on the on the table and 
you come back 15 minutes later and all the petals have fallen off. Nobody's going to take that award away because it, when it was judged, it was fine. You say take that the the, the award away. I no no no. Nobody's going to take an award. Oh, away. nobody going to take. Okay, all right. Yeah, because that's what I was confused. So how can you do that? You know, because it didn't came out clear. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Miss Kaplan. Okay, so Craig, we have about a minute left. Um, did you want to give any closing remarks or did you want to take one more question? If, if there are no questions, uh, I'll, I'll just say thanks for your attention. It's it's been an uh, it's been an interesting two hours and I had some good discussion and uh, we we know what I know what still confuses people <laughs> at this point. We'll, we'll try and uh, we'll try and work that out so that, that it's not confusing. Thank you so much and thank everyone for attending today. We really appreciate it. Uh, please keep uh, watch out on Facebook and um, on the website for upcoming uh, webinars that we may be having. And again, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.